So the anxiety triggers defenses, it's active before we're aware. Another thing about anxiety from Gray's model is not only does anxiety turn on when bad things are about to happen, then it's a good warning system, anxiety turns on when new things happen, right? And so it doesn't have to be because, oh, every time I do something new, something bad happens. It's an automatic reaction. When there's something new, your brain gets more vigilant, and it's that anxiety kind of reaction that happens. If I'm working somebody through therapy, and they're getting better, and everything's working better, and now we're moving toward some, other, some more positive kinds of behaviors, then those people may get anxious and nervous, not because I'm afraid it's going to be like my mom, they're going to get anxious and nervous because I've never been here. But what do I talk to somebody about if I'm not talking about how scared relationships make me? Okay. Well, I've got to think of something else to talk about, but I'm lost, and now I'm anxious again, not because of the history, but because going into a new place itself get, gets me anxious. Another thing that I talk about in those kinds of situations is, um, is the empty head. If I have no networks associated with operating as a healthy person, Okay, then when I start to try to operate as a healthy person, I don't know what to say. And then maybe we need to develop skills for what do you say to somebody when you're on a date and you're not talking about all your issues. All right? Let's talk about the movies, let's talk about baseball, let's talk about you know, what things I'm looking forward to doing. <coughs> Sorry. Um, but, but, but I've got to do something to build new networks because the old networks were all focused on the negative. One of the things about making that kind of shift is that um, it's, is the example of abused spouses, and you know, I guess a lot of times abused women. Why would they stay in an abusive relationship? Well, my dad abused me, my dad yelled at me, my dad hit me, you know, now my husband hits me. If I try to get out of it and I try to stand on my own, well, that's scary. I don't know how to stand on my own. That's a lost feeling. But even if I was in a relationship with a person who treated me nicely, that in itself causes anxiety because I don't know how to be in a relationship with somebody who treats me nicely. It makes me anxious and nervous. I end up back with my husband who was beating me even though my jaw was broken a year and a half ago because at least I know what's going on. It feels familiar. And so, so in that way, you know, novelty triggers anxiety and one of my jobs is to help the person move forward. Another thing that I encourage people to, uh, to remember is anxiety is valuable. When we're talking about performance anxiety, you mentioned that, do I want to get rid of anxiety? I don't want somebody to be so calm about giving their presentation they don't even try to prepare, because who cares? You know, anxiety, I want to do a good job, I don't want anything bad, I'm going to work hard at this. We just don't want it to go over the top. Um, if, they, if people come in with the goal of, I don't want to feel anxious anymore, right? Well, what this is, the example that I would say is, do you want to get rid of pain? Well, yeah, Doc, I want to get rid of pain. So you go into the kitchen, you have the burner on, you put your hand on the burner, but you have no pain. Is this a good thing? This is a bad thing. The stuff that's going on in our brains, some of it's gotten out of whack and it's taken us in bad directions, but we need pain and we need anxiety and we need those things. We don't want to get rid of them. We want them to work well for us. And it's a model that I can talk to people about. And so it's not like we're trying to get rid of it. We're trying to help it work better. You know, so if we go back to Sammy again, you know, and we're trying to help him get through, he's actually starting to do better. He's gotten so he can talk to Mr. K, and he's actually now, he's not just hanging out with girls, but he's actually starting to be more interested. He has some male friends, and he's even thinking he'd want to play um, on the middle school basketball team. And so he wants to go out and start playing on the middle school basketball team. Well, guess what? Talking to guys in the middle school basketball locker is not like talking to girls who are talking about what they were doing the other night and what they think and feel. And so Sammy then walks into there and now he panics because he's clueless. He doesn't know how to act here. He doesn't know how to talk here. And so our job is, well, Sammy, of course you're, you feel anxious because you don't know what to do. It's not the same as the old stuff or the abuse stuff. You just got to learn to put up that garbage they do in there. And so, and to talk with them and not, and not tell them that they shouldn't be doing that because then that's not going to help you either. 
Uh, and so we can help him develop uh, new strategies, we can help him hang in there, we can employ and engage teachers in trying to make sure stuff goes smoothly, and after a while, he begins to, be to develop some new ideas about what to say and do, and his anxiety also habituates, it gets lower because he's been in the situation over and over again, and that helps him settle back down. And so in that way, we can help Sammy get through his, to, to finish getting well and then get through his anxiety about becoming a guy who can be competent and try new situations uh, and help him move forward. All right. So there's anxiety, just to remember where we are. And this is a summary, where, summary of where we've come so far. So we've got uh, input process output, top, middle, bottom, neural networks, implicit, explicit memories, affect, and anxiety. Um, and, and we've been working our way through that. Now, if we, if we look at our big picture, again, we're gonna think of what's contributing to the problem, you know, what's, uh, what's being affected by the problem, and then, and then what we can do to help it. So, you know, when we have a seven-year-old with emotional reactivity, is it coming out of, it's an expression of the seven-year-old's anxiety about a new situation? Is it an expression of his arousal is out of control? Is it an emotional thing? He's got bipolar disorder. And then what's being disrupted? He still does okay in this class or that class, but he has trouble in the classes that are the most difficult for him because you know simple classes he can manage, but the, um, but the more difficult classes he can't manage. Um, or is it maybe his fear of failure? He's had so many problems so far that now he expects to fail. And that's a different kind of intervention. And, and we're thinking, what are we gonna do and, and how can we uh, help him move forward? Okay, so um, we're gonna start talking about um, just development for a little while, and then I'll start talking some about just trying to apply this stuff in some of the clinical settings as we move toward wrapping up. But let's take about another seven and a half minute break, and then we'll get back together. So let's start talking about development. Um, the main themes in development in the brain are that genetics interacts with experience, um, as, as I look through the literature and the things that I read, it's not a question of is it nature or is it nurture. Um, we're blessed with a certain set of genetic in, inclinations. Our brain is likely to move in a certain direction, okay, but we need a certain set of experiences to help it happen. That little one-year-old kid who was so badly neglected probably started out with a brain that was open to moving forward and making, you know, be learning how to self-soothe and learning how to integrate information, but when he was so badly um, left alone, then that didn't develop. So genetics interacts with experience. Another study um, that was done in New Zealand was a really interesting study. They, they connected it really clearly to a specific chromosomal difference between two groups of, of kids. And what they found was there's an adaptive cr version of the chromosome and a maladaptive version of the chromosome, and they were able to follow this cohort of kids. And what they found was that if you had the good version of the chromosome and you were raised in a good family, then behaviorally and socially and psychologically you did pretty well. If you had the good version of the chromosome and you were raised in a bad family, you were still a pretty resilient kid and you didn't look that much different than other kids. You somehow survived being in this rough family. If you had a bad version of the chromosome and you were raised with a positive, supportive, helpful kind of family, you look like everybody else, all the kids functioning pretty well. If you had a bad version of the chromosome and you ended up in a bad family situation, you were a mess. Okay, so, so the, 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 the message out of that for me is the genetics is not the whole picture. It gives you an inclination, it makes probabilities happen. Your environment can shift things for you. It doesn't always have to turn out just the way your genes you know, might have it. Um, but in the main thing, you know, genes interact with experience. Creating connections is a main part of the whole thing of development. You know, we've talked about it before, you know, the more experiences you have, it builds connections between the neurons and you have a heavier brain if you've had more experiences. Uh, so creating connections. And then another element is streamlining connections and we'll talk about that. 
What we're doing is when we're working with kids versus working with adults is when we're working with kids, we're trying to help the networks get laid down. We're putting in the wires, okay? And so if we can help the family put in the wires better, then that kid's gonna have more potential to function well in the future. If I'm working with a 35 year old, then we're probably sort of working with the wires that are there. And if there are some messed up wires, we need to work around them. Maybe we're gonna have to run an extension cord around this room because the wires in that room don't work. Um, and so we're looking for ways to use the wires that we have in order to make things run better. Again, there's a little bit of each and the whole way through, but it's a tendency to be more of one and more of the other. Okay, so I got a different version of the brain here. What's missing? Well, decision making's missing. Okay, so that's not there very much. What else is missing? Integration is missing. And so in this sort of, I guess, maybe eight or nine or 10 year old brain, some of the higher order processing is not there. Okay, and you know, but it's what we're hoping we'll get as they get older. Um, and that's sort of, again, something that's just a, um, a way to look that helps us think about uh, you know, how things, uh, you know, what a kid works with and, and how we're going to move forward with them. The hip, you know, I talked to you about the hippocampal kind of system coming on, you know, fairly slowly and then integration systems coming on much more slowly. And, and so what we're doing is we're ending up, you know, as I talked to parents the other day, we're going to do a whole lot of implicit training in our parenting. Implicit means I need the repetitions to happen over and over and over again in the same way. Okay, I'm not going to count on you know the rule, you better do it right. Okay, I'm going to count on you know the rule, up, oh, you didn't do it right, here's a consequence. You know the rule, up, oh, you didn't do it right, here's a consequence. I don't need to go into a rage because they know the rule and they didn't do it right. I say, well, you didn't do it right. Here, we're gonna have a consequence again. And, and the implicit system will be learning what I was saying to the parents. I will talk about the connections. I will talk about if you do this kind of behavior, your life will be less happy. Your relationships in the future will be less happy. Guess what, it's not gonna change that behavior this week. What's gonna change the behavior this week is you don't play video games if it happens. All right, and I try to connect them, but I'm relying on the implicit system rather than relying on the explicit system. Okay, so these are the steps we're looking at. We're looking at migration of neurons, which happens mostly in utero. We're looking at arborization, which is when the neurons are spreading their arms out to attach to each other, and synaptogenesis, they're making their connections that hook up with each other. And then we're looking at pruning, you whack off the neurons that aren't being used. It's survival of the fittest. It's ugly uh, evolutionary competition in your brain, which is what's supposed to happen. And then down at the bottom, we have myelination, which is something that helps integrate the brain. When we think about my, uh, migration, uh, what we're talking about is when the brain first starts to form, there's a small little tube and it starts putting out new neurons. And those neurons are sent out to form a shell around the tube. And then another layer of neurons gets formed and they are sent out through the layer that's already there and they form around on the outside. In the cortex, by the time the cortex finishes, there are six layers, okay? Out of that tube, neurons have come and gone to their correct place, you know, laying in on top of the set that was there before throughout the, the pregnancy especially during the second trimester, that kind of migration is very important. So if, she's, if the mom is walking into the bathroom at the bar and there are three lines of cocaine and she's whipping that stuff up her nose and she does that five times a week, the migration gets disrupted by these chemicals that are going into this neo, the, the, um, the kid in the, the fetus's brain and it's messing up. Same with alcohol. And so migration is getting disturbed. Um, there is a kiddo that, you know, when I think, what do these kids end up looking like then? So I was doing an assessment on a kiddo, you know, her mom was clearly into the party and into the doing the drugs and alcohol, all that stuff was going on. And so this kid's now being raised by her grandmother. And so first she was identified as speech impaired, then she was identified as autistic, and now she's being identified as emotionally disturbed. This kid has a disorganized brain. When did it happen? She was raised by her grandmother. Okay, when she came out into the world, her experiences were okay. 
not perfect, I met her grandmother, but she was, she was still her experiences were pretty good. Her, her the, what destroyed her brain, what made things work so poorly for her happened in utero. And then so we're working at trying to manage things and we're better, yeah. Not, not that I know of, um, and certainly that's the kind of thing that would be up there, I think, if they, if they could establish anything, yeah. Um, I mean, again, I think, I think there's a lot of the, the more pure, the, the less chemicals, the less all of that kind of stuff, the better. You know, the less stress, again, even during in utero, when I'm doing an interview about what was life like for this kid that we're working with, I'm asking the parents, what was life like during pregnancy? Well, you know, the worst case scenario is, you know, my husband punched me three times in the stomach when he was mad because he wanted to get rid of the baby. Okay, so I'm worried about what happened then. But you could hand have, you know, I'm a high-stress mom. I was working at a high-stress job. It was really intense, and I might have gotten fired. Well, so the baby had nine months of adrenaline, okay? And it probably, uh, uh, you know, affects things somewhat. I think the research is not totally clear, and you're not going to say, oh, well, then this kid's going to be this way. Because you, you have an interaction between genetics and you have an interaction between chemical exposure and those things. But those are things I ask because I need to know what are some of the possibilities that may have happened for this kid. Another kid that, um, that I uh, assessed was, um, he again, you know, at these mixed up things. And, and the schools, they're trying to figure out what to do. And some schools have pretty rigid ways. We'll do this for an autistic kid. We'll do this for an ED kid and we'll do this for a regular kid. They're pretty rigidly set up like that. So I end up doing this evaluation with this kiddo, and I happened to see the six-month-old evaluation of him, you know, 10 years ago, and said, oh yeah, he had, they were called hygromas. Hygromas are water sacs in his brain. Water sacs that led people to think, this kid may be dead in two years, okay, that his brain is gonna be so damaged by this stuff. Um, and he had migrational anomalies, according to the neurologist, when this kid was six months old. Well, he's been treated as autistic, he's been treated as emotionally disturbed, he's been you know, treated as a bad kid. All those different things have happened, but this kid is not in any of those categories, all right? Um, but he's having trouble and he has trouble integrating information because of these difficulties he had early on. The hygromas went away, okay, so he had these sacks full of fluid that were shoving his brain around, they went away, and now his brain is back to having the space it used to have. But it's not the same brain as if he'd never had those, okay, it has shifted the development and we have to work with him then, and we look at his behaviors to tell us what's working and what's not. You know, for him, when things got real complicated, he got overwhelmed. If things could stay pretty straightforward, he would learn stuff and actually do a good job. He liked being connected to people, but if there were too many people in the classroom, he got overwhelmed. So he wasn't autistic, I don't want to be with anybody, but he certainly had trouble integrating information and managing it. Um, so those, but that was you know, migrational anomalies and those kind of things. 